Hey, the crazy man here. In this Star Trek video, I present you with amazing goose from the original series. You may not believe, like shirts that explode, rocks that bounce when they hit a man's head, and a strange case of deja vu. And stick around to the end for lots of crazy fun bloopers. But this is not the way it is. On the episode, Charlie X. Kirk is on his way to the bridge with Charlie. I'm on my way to the bridge now. He's going directly to the bridge alongside Charlie and notice he's wearing his regular golden shirt. We are at full output enterprise. I must speak to Captain Kirk. I suppose in the future they may have adapted some of Batman's technology. Fascinating. In the episode, Where No Man Has Gone Before, Time seems to act a little wonky on the bridge. Watch what happens when Kirk steps off the elevator onto the bridge. See this guy in a blue shirt? In one shot, he's past Kirk, heading toward the elevator. You ready, Mr. Alden? Acknowledge, Mr. Mitchell. You know, I think Kirk had a serious sense of deja vu. And watch as the other guy in the blue shirt seems to completely disappear. Guess he went where no man has gone before. Later, Mitchell uses his newly acquired mental superpowers to knock a rock down next to Kirk, but closer observation concludes that he may have had a helping hand. This could also be evidence that Thing from the Adams Family is either a time traveler or is immortal. I am pretty sure that I've seen Lurch hanging out in the Star Trek universe. You know, I've often thought that Captain Kirk is a lot stronger than we seem to think. I mean, look how he pushes in solid rock so easily. In the episode, What Are Little Girls Made Of? Captain Kirk proves he can do amazing things, even manipulate space while being transported through space. Somehow, he manages to move closer to Christine Chapel while being beamed down to a planet. Now if he didn't have something to do with it, then they have some major problems because eventually they are liable to have people transported right on top of each other. In the first part of the two-parter, The Menagerie, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are beaming down, but somehow a hedge gets brought down with them. If you look at the weird looking statue, you'll notice there's no hedge anywhere around it. Then when they beam down, you can see in the close-up that now there is a hedge. But quite impossible. In the episode, The Conscious of the King, Star Day. Lieutenant Uhura sings a very slow song at the request of this very bored individual. How does she sing the last word of the song with her mouth closed? And does her choice in music mean music in the future is going to be really slow? Hey, I said it's really slow, not necessarily terrible. In the episode, surely if Captain Kirk gets into a fight with what amounts to a figure from his imagination, or at least his past. When this figure from Kirk's past, named Finnegan, throws the captain over, Kirk is lying on the ground, shirt intact. And then suddenly, without even moving from that spot, his shirt is suddenly ripped to shreds. Could it be that Kirk flexed his mighty muscles while on his back ripping his shirt apart? You know, actually, Shatner was ahead of his time because every action hero was ripping his shirt off in the 80s. Also, in this episode, there's a scene where you can see what looks like smoke coming from somebody smoking next to the cameraman. On the episode The Galileo 7, Spock leads a team that is attacked by giants. In one scene, the giant spear appears to be coming from one direction, but Spock is aiming in the opposite direction. If I didn't know any better, I'd almost think that Leonard Nimoy didn't himself know which direction he was supposed to be aiming for. Of course, in all fairness, we can't see where the giant's at. Maybe he jumped across. But what I find baffling is why the giant's shield seems to be a normal human-sized shield when it falls down, and when Spock goes to investigate it, it's grown to giant proportions. Illogical. Totally. Even though the shuttle is in sort of bad shape in this scene, the doors still have automatic sound effects. 
even though it appears somebody is opening the door by hand. So, I'm not sure if this is a goof or not. When Spock gets hit by a big boulder, it's almost as if it's so light that he's really having to hold it in place so it doesn't roll off of him. In the episode Tomorrow is Yesterday, one of my favorite episodes by the way, because time travel just happens to be one of my favorite storylines. In this episode, the computer screens may have been affected by the time travel that occurred at the beginning of the episode because they look more like paper than actual screens. They have a very wrinkled look to them. Kind of like most of the posters in my comic book room. Hope you're enjoying the video so far. Please don't forget to leave a comment, let me know what you think, and let everybody else know what you think. Hopefully it's good. One of the benefits, some might say, about better television screens and higher definition is we notice things we might have missed on older TV sets back in the day. Like when our favorite actors have been replaced with stuntmen. Why did you do that? <laughs> on the episode, The Return of the Archons, Kirk's landing party ends up in the middle of chaos in a town that looks suspiciously a lot like Mayberry, where the locals have gone into a frenzy and are throwing rocks at everybody. One of Kirk's men appears to get hit on the head with a rock and it seems to just bounce off. Talk about hard-headed. Or was there something wrong with that rock? Okay, I'm not suggesting that they should have thrown real rocks for the sake of realism. We live in a world where you have to clarify everything these days. That's a joke, boy! You missed it! Went right past you! you when they go inside a nearby building to seek shelter, the windows and the doors disappear once they're on the inside. I don't understand this. Later in the episode, a computer attacks the crew with a hypersonic sound wave. Before that happens though, the guy in the back to your left jumped the gun just a bit, covering his ears a minute or so before the actual attack. Oh. It seems as though the actor confused the sound of the hologram appearing, possibly with the sound of the attack. What do they want from us? Before that scene, the townsfolk act like zombies and force Kirk to fire phasers on stun. You know, I thought it was really nice of the zombie lady on the ground to move her leg out of the way so that they could get by. The next goof comes from the episode Space Seed, which is the one that introduces us to Khan, played by Ricardo Montalban, who I've always enjoyed watching act. After Kirk's conversation with Khan, the actor playing a security guard changes between shots as Kirk leaves. Plus, of course, the actor was losing hair really fast. You know, you have to wonder how much laser guns cost. Thought to be one of the best Star Trek episodes, The City on the Edge of Forever, another time travel episode, guest stars Joan Collins and finds Kirk and Spock traveling back to the past in New York City. But strangely enough, Kirk walks right past Floyd's Barbershop from Mayberry, North Carolina. Fascinating. Of course, this set was part of the Archeo 40 Acres lot. Mayberry was also seen on Batman in the 1950s Superman a few times before it was even used as Mayberry. On the Star Trek episode Miri, they turned Mayberry into sort of a post-apocalyptic planet that mirrored Earth. Another little interesting fact, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy even walked the same area where Opie throws the rocks on the Andy Griffith intro at Franklin Lake. Next, a goof from the episode, A Piece of the Action. The crew has landed on a gangster planet. Notice the bench that Captain Kirk is leaning on. How did it get back there so fast? You see, one second, Kirk is on the sidewalk with Spock and McCoy, and the next split second, he's not. What was the worst episode of the original series, you may ask? It may be the third season episode, Spock's Brain. According to Shatner, this was one of the worst, and Leonard Nimoy said he was embarrassed during the entire shooting of this episode. His brain is gone. In this episode, they actually have Spock running around without a brain. 
The crew has been given belts that inflict pain upon the person wearing the belt. One second, you see Spock's brainless body is wearing one, and the other second, he's not. And then he is again. Oh well, all episodes can't be winners. And now, some classic Star Trek bloopers. You have no right. And we have the right. But you have no right. Because we have the right. Then you have the right. Refuse to move out on cue? Screw them! Oh. Have no fear. Sargon is here. <laughs> I want you to know, in the rushes, I am doing this shot under protest. I don't know about you, but this is not the way it I want to move! Don't anybody move. Admiral! I am receiving hailstorms. <laughs> I think we'll find what we're looking for at the Cetacean Institute in Sausalito. Here, I'm back. Nails? Nails? Yes. <laughs> Captain, you forgot all about the environment and all that stuff. Do you want to really do that? What does it mean, exact change? I'm trying to think of a good answer, but the film is going to the camera and it's giving me sense of anxiety. Thanks for watching the TV Crazy Man channel. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell so you don't miss any new videos. And talk about your Star Trek memories in the comments below. Oh, and if you like cartoons or know somebody that does, check out my other channel, Brady Cat Cartoons. Thanks and have a great day.